Dr. Daniel Pauly of the University of British Columbia is one of the most eminent fisheries scientists in the world, and one of the very few to look at the world's fisheries as a whole. He's an authority on declining fish stocks and the developer of innovative and powerful tools to measure the decline and to model the impact of environmental changes on specific fish stocks. In 2002, he made headlines by arguing that commercially fished species like cod, tuna, and flounder will be effectively extinct within a few decades unless we reduce fishing dramatically and set up large no-fish zones to allow stocks to recover. Overall, he says, the fishing industry is a global Ponzi scheme. And it's not just one fishery that's failing, it's the whole system. I wanted to start, I think, with the question of baselines, because I think you're, you were the person who came up with the phrase shifting baselines, yeah. which I think is a, In a really, yeah. Yeah, really, important, a really important phrase. Um, it strikes me that a lot of what you've done is an attempt to stop the baselines from shifting. Is that...? Uh, That's true. And also, also identifying baseline in the past that we can use for orientation. Because, because of shifting baseline, we, we tend to accommodate the present and, and state. And uh, recognizing that, uh, that there's a shift in the, these baselines, um, you don't want it to shift anymore. That's one. And uh, you want to also make, make others uh, share in the understanding that uh, the world was different before. And um, so both, both recognizing that there was another baseline and, and trying to stop the degradation away from it. Yeah. Someone told me once that, that, that when you're born and when you make your way into the world and you become aware of it, you immediately seem that, that this is the way it always was. And, yes. and in a and sense, that's, you, you're com it's completely hidden to you that there was an earlier state. Yeah, and it, it has a certain mythical quality, was pe what people tell you. That is, it is an, of another order. This is written, it's sometimes written in a quaint language. This is uh, acquired via history, lessons, or that uh, may be tainted by, by notions that you don't like anymore. And uh, so this is not communicated to you the same way that uh, the things that you can see. So it's very difficult to compare. There's, a, there's the apple of the past and the origin of the present. They, they, they are difficult to put in the same scale. And, uh, but the invention of quantitative uh, science actually should enable that to you to to find this common denominator. You 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 try to transform what you have as qualitative information in the past into solid, more solid information, and uh, it it goes surprisingly well, surprisingly well if you attempt that. For example, in the, in the East Coast. Uh, People have used old logbooks, colleagues have used old logbooks of uh, Boston-based uh, um, uh, uh, cod fishers to uh, infer what uh, the density of cod were. Uh, of cod was in uh, off, uh, the Gulf of Maine and north of it, and, uh, and they, were suc they succeeded so well that you can see that the rebuilding effort that we attempt now are rebuilding toward a baseline that is one tenth or so of the baseline that would have been available if you used uh, 1850. So we've lost 90 percent of the yeah. of what of the biomass or the number of fish. We or? we lost 90 percent of the biomass when we, we try to rebuild. In other words, we, we try to rebuild toward uh, something that is already reduced. Okay, so even by 1850, it's it's yeah. considerably reduced. Yeah. Now, this is actually what Farley Mowitz writes about in Sea of Slaughter. Is exactly, exactly. This, this was, uh, this, like everything, it is, it is never new. It is uh, rehashed in, a, in the fashion of the day. And uh, Farley Mowitz called it Sea of Slaughter. And uh, uh, he, he described a world in which animals are completely gone. And the very existence is doubtful. For example, the, the penguin story, the great orc. People don't barely believe it when you tell them that there was a great orc, that this was called penguin, and that, uh, that the, uh, the place was full of them. 
they, they barely believe you because uh, on the sea you have seagull and, and you have cormorant and that's it. Yeah. And uh, yes, and uh, I, uh, for me the most painful story there, we did an interview with Farley and, and the most painful story for me in the book and it actually made him almost cry in the interview was, was the telling about the last great dog because we yeah. actually know yeah, what happened yeah. to it. Right? And, and we know too many last specimen of it, uh, whether it Tasmanian tiger or, or, or uh, subspecies of, uh, of, um, of turtles or Galapagos. This is, this is really something that we are probably are the only, the first generation or in a group of generation, four or five generation that have seen the last of. It was extremely rare before because the baseline rate, the, the normal rate of species extinction is much lower than now. I was thinking that as you were speaking, I was thinking the difference between the world I took for granted as a, as a child, and you would have too a little later, um, and the world that our grandchildren would take for yeah. granted is, is, a, is, a, is a huge gap. There, yeah. Can there ever have been a time in history when the gap between those two baselines were so great in just a, a well, lifetime? Well, you know? this, is, uh, this uh, implies a, a change and a lack of communication, a lack of the possibility of communication between the generation because you are actually talking about another world. We, we know that uh, with regard to electronics, that the parents cannot tell the children anything. So the whole notion that we had of wisdom and of older folks knowing things that the young cannot know, uh, this is, uh, has taken a real setback. But uh, with regard to the natural world, this is, this is uh, partly bad. Um, uh, I have a colleague who is uh, who has studied uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Gulf of California, uh, three generation of fishes, 60, 40, and 20 year old, and basically the, when the fish are gone, the knowledge about the fish cannot be passed on, and half of it get lost. She could quantify that half of it gets lost per generation. So when the fish are gone, the the knowledge that uh, the First Nation or the fishers have, for example. Um, the local traditional knowledge get passed on reasonably well because it gets re renewed every, by every encounter with the, with the animal in question. But the, when the animals are gone, uh, the, the knowledge becomes superfluous and it passes away. So you can exterminate a species without, without noticing, actually over several generations. And this is probably what happened in North America um, 10,000 years ago when 40 species of large mammals were lost, that uh, the, 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 the animals, for example, the mammoth and mastodont and so on, uh, became rare before they were extinguished. Uh, that is a, a thing that we must also realize, that you never, you never exterminate uh, an abundant species, you always exterminate a species that is rare, because you have rendered it rare first. Yeah. So, so you never have a feeling that you have lost something that was important because they always go to two or three generations of being rare. So, so they could have, they could have, and there's good simulation show, suggesting that it could have happened, but they could have exterminated 40 species without even knowing about it, uh, without the tradition of them being available, having passed on to the next generation. That's astonishing that, that, that it would just be totally forgotten. Yeah. But you've been trying to, and it seems to me in, in, uh, in a, a whole range of your work, you've been trying to determine what the situation was in the past, but even more importantly, what the situation is now. So yeah. you've got something to... Th this is a big fight. On the, on the past, uh, I think, this is going to be modest, but I would say it anyway. In this paper in 95, probably triggered off something like a, a historical ecology and uh, they are in, uh, in the US and uh, there are several students who do their PhD on reconstructing the past from uh, what can be gathered and using quantitative, inter uh, using mathematical and uh, quantitative techniques to turn the qualitative information that we have into qualitative uh, information. and. Um, um, this, uh, this tends to produce surprising results, but that are well-founded. 
and uh, it could be it could be that it it becomes a, a proper subdiscipline of ecology, historical ecology, and the with the present, say the last fifty years or so. Um, we are trying to establish that we do have to rebuild to a, a higher level. But there are people uh, in our field as well, like uh, denialists, who say everything is fine and we are at uh, the proper level, we don't need to do anything, and we are not losing things. And, and, uh, are these serious, serious scientists who say that? They, well, yeah. You, you, only go a few kilometers to the University of Washington, and this is the prevalent view. And uh, this is, is profoundly harmful because, uh, as in the case of, uh, of climate change, you can use one group of scientists against the other and stuff and uh, play them against each other, and then the, the, you don't need to do anything while the problem grows in monstrosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, climate change, though, the science seems to be, if you really look at the serious scientists, there's not much argument there. One should think so. Well, Bill Weiss, uh, whom you have interviewed yeah. earlier, uh, told me two, days, two, three days ago, I saw him at a uh, UBC uh, meeting, that, um, that they are in the U.S. 720, somebody has counted them, uh, outfits, uh, little think tank, up to the big ones, uh, of two persons or hundreds, uh, that varies, who, whose sole mission is to uh, deny that there is uh, global warming. And I must say, you have been very effective. You guys mm -hmm. have been very effective because, because in the US, um, the journalists, for example, don't bring that up. You know, the, the uh, an entire state, the biggest continent, the states in the, in the continental U.S., uh, uh, contiguous states, uh, Texas is burning up, but nobody mentions uh, the possibility that it might be linked to the global warming. They do it corresponds to the prediction that are being made. This is frightening because, and it is very much at variance with what you experience in Europe. I, I, com I was just in Europe for a longer, a longer trip, and. Uh, I met colleagues who work in university who have, uh, which have all created subunits devoted to the problem of climate change and, and uh, how you can mitigate and how you, what you can do something about it. In Europe, it is accepted as an academic topic, as a, as a, a thing you, you, you're worried and concerned about. I'm not saying that the political response is is ideal, but at least this is not contested, and and in Canada, this is not contested either. It, it's a it's a problem of the U.S. Uh, mainly, but with public relations more than a scientific problem. Oh I mean, yes, it is, it is purely a public relations problem, and it indicates clearly that uh, scientists, uh, the vision of scientists or the view that scientists uh, should keep to the in the lab and uh, should keep to themselves and let let uh, the managers or the, let the political process take the, uh, happens uh, un unroll, so to say that this vision uh, um, assumed is is based on a previous view of science, on a previous role of science uh, where where we where we are embedded in a in a vision of pros of progress when. The whole of society believed that it was, it was, it was involved in, in progress, and science was the motor of that. So the Pasteur and the, the great scientists of the past, they were embedded in a in a view that science was was contributing to this progress of society as a whole. Now, scientists are viewed are viewed as uh, just one of the pressure groups. So, on the issue of global warming, you would have uh, various pressure groups, all of them more legit as legitimate as the other, and the scientists are, this is funny, but uh, a pressure group which, uh, who are pushing for grants, you know, and uh, therefore they say that this vision is, uh, 
Actually, it might be linked with a postmodernist uh, take on, on, on culture, but uh, this is a present that uh, the postmodernists have given us. The, uh, this is obviously not so, but, uh, but lots of, I guess, lots of people in the media have gone through the, the other branch of the university where postmodernism has a sway and, and, and do believe this scenario that uh, the science is just one way of, of asserting privileges. Yeah. yeah. But you know, the process can't work if it doesn't have accurate information, if it doesn't, under, if it, if it doesn't know yes. what the reality is. Yes. So I wanted to come back to, to, to your own specific research because it seems to me, again, and if you wouldn't mind leading us through a bit of this, what you've been doing is developing tools to get real information about yeah. something that's exceptionally difficult uh, yes. to pop uh, populations. The, the basic tool has been, uh, you see, the physicists, when they, and I suffer from physics envy, I should say, uh, the physicists, when they don't see something, uh, when a process is uh, a bit uncertain, they don't develop a statistical tool to make it, to, to, to cancel out the noise, which we do in biology, develop statistical tool to, to, to see it better. The physicists build a bigger machine. They simply build a bigger machine, and then the process which was, uh, un which was uh, fuzzy becomes clear. Imagine a telescope or microscope. Be the 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 CERN, the the big the big uh, collider. Simply build a bigger machine, and uh, so in fisheries, you 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 never know when a stock goes down. Well, is it is it part of a bigger trend? And so, uh, you, is it is it the case that this is going down? Well. You need a bigger machine in time. You need to look at is the, if this 10 years or 20 years worth of data uh, continue a trend from before. So you need a time machine in a sense. And then is in this bay the fish have gone down in this gulf? Well, would you like to know, would you not like to know how it is in the other gulfs? And the bigger machine then has been is for us the whole world ocean the last 50 years or 60 years. Why? Because in 1950, the FAO uh, uh, started, started uh, uh, publishing uh, uh, annual uh, reports on the catch of the whole world. And though this is being contested by lots of colleagues, but the catch is, is a sample that, that uh, hundreds of boats, thousands of boats are taken for us in all over the world. So, so our, if we developed uh, tools to analyze this catch in a reasonable way, um, then, then we will have a global representation over a long term. We will have built a bigger machine. The point is, what do catch tell us and, 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 and about the world? And they tell us that uh, we are fishing down the food web because the catch composition uh, uh, was before uh, big fish and now it tends to be smaller fish lower in the food web. That is measured by trophic level and that goes down. Now, there are, there are ways to analyze this that uh, mask, mask uh, the result, that mask this, this fishing down and uh, the colleagues that have been misled by these masking effects write the process is not happening, but the process here is happening. Another, another thing that you see is that the catch of the world increase until the 80s and then it decreases. Well, the catch, catches might decrease for different reasons. For example, because you are very wise and you decide to not go fishing anymore because the stocks are not doing well or because something's happening. But, but this is not happening worldwide. Uh, actually, the catch are declining in spite of a tremendous increase of fishing effort. We know about the fishing effort continuing to increase in various countries and, and globally. 
So that the catch going down, in spite of this increasing effort, is an indication of depleted stocks. So we can use that for inferences. But again, as with the global warming, there are people who deny things that stare you in the face. And so we now have to demonstrate that these two things, which uh, for about 10 years have been accepted generally as uh, reflecting uh, massive trends, are in fact reflecting massive trends. Just like you, the people who have, uh, for example, developed uh, hockey sticks uh, uh, for temperatures and, and other phenomena have to again and again demonstrate that these are, these are legitimate results and not uh, manipulation. One of the confounding factors, I've lived through this, I mean, I, I, am, I lived for uh, 35 years in a fishing village, which was catching fish when I arrived, and catching fish fairly close in to, to yeah. on the continental shelf. And, uh, and, and, and we were being told th you know, over the years that the catches were fine, the cod were doing fine, and so forth. But what was happening, in fact, was that You're the fishing. capacity to, well, not only were we fishing further out, always fishing further out, but also um, the, 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 the equipment became so sophisticated yeah. that you could, you could make a huge catch, and you were catching yep. a much yep. larger yep. proportion of the population. In fact, if, act to take account of this, uh, this is about 2% per year uh, of, of, we call it, uh, technological creep. Uh, you, you can see that uh, the increase in, uh, in effort is even bigger than uh, suggested by the number of vessels and so on. But uh, people um, are not aware of this, uh, of, this, of this and of the, especially of the expansion of fisheries and what the big machine that I was speaking about that we have constructed for the first time showed in a way that could not be argued against is that fisheries have expanded uh, geographically. And this is, uh, we have generated uh, several papers now and uh, simulation uh, visualizations that show um, the, the fisheries bursting out of the industrial countries because uh, low level fishing existed throughout the world uh, until the 50s, but industrial fishing was confined to uh, industrial countries. But as they, as they depleted the local stocks in Japan, in India, in, uh, sorry, in Japan and in, uh, in Europe and in North America, then they had to go elsewhere. For first offshore, then uh, southwards. And this southward expansion is so beautiful. It, it is, uh, that is happening. We could uh, clock it at 0.8 degree of latitude per year. And uh, this is almost like a metronome, toc, 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 point eight. Uh, the fisheries, uh, the catches, stem from, a, from a, an area whose centroid is uh, getting uh, further south. And it continues because uh, the catches in the northern hemisphere decline more rapidly than the southern. And uh, at the end, you will have only krill in, in Antarctica. Uh, Fisheries for krill in Antarctica have now begun, and uh, you know, fishing with big tubes, pumping it out, and feeding it to to salmon. Uh, this is uh, for salmon feed, and this operation, this operation, uh, you can predict them because uh, they are on this 0.8 degree latitude uh, per year kind of thing, and uh, the expansion uh, from the from the 50s to the 80s was about one, mil one, square, one million square kilometer per year. One million square kilometer per year. And then in the 80s, it uh, grew rapidly because, because uh, the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea was declared, and uh, it closed certain um, coastlines to fishing. For example, Canada uh, declared a fishing exclusion zone, uh, the US, and so on. And other countries uh, did, did also, did too, but it could not prevent uh, powerful countries from getting in. For example, uh, Europe uh, goes into African countries by an access agreement, you know, uh, whereas, uh, whereas Japan was asked out of the US and, and there was no discussion about that. And, and um, 
So, so this expansion increased to about three, four million square kilometer per year in the 80s. And uh, so you get an idea what it is. This is about one Amazonas. The Amazon is about three, four million square kilometer. And then it, it flattens out because there is nowhere else to go. So the expansion is finished. And that's the reason, actually, why catches globally are declining. Because now uh, you're you cannot expand anymore, and, and hence you cannot. Uh, it, it's like a Ponzi scheme that when you finished, when you uh, have uh, gotten uh, capital from all your friends and, 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 and their friends, then the whole thing implodes. And we're at that point now. Where we are, yeah. But except that the implosion is uh, very, very tiny. Uh, we. It, I'm often asked, when is it going to happen? People imagine this is going to be one thing, like a like, like, uh, dramatic thing, like the, the stock uh, of cod right. collapsing and the, president, uh, the minister saying, I close the fishery. But this is, this is not so. Uh, this, is an, this is not likely to happen in many cases. Rather, what happens is that this skipper or this fisher cannot operate and quits. And, and this area is not fished anymore because it's not worth going there. And that, that little, this little decision, repeated millions of times, produced a declining catch without anybody really noticing. You've said that not one fishery is failing, but the whole system. Yeah, this is that, the banking system. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go after the, the a local branch of and say, oh, that's because they have, uh, they have given loan to, to John Smith, who has uh, gone to Las Vegas. Uh, you wouldn't say the crisis is due to that. The crisis is due to the whole system actually uh, infecting each other with things like uh, subprimes. And even, even a healthy bank that wouldn't do that would be swept by the, by the current that this generates. And a country that would not do these things, uh, it would not overexploit its resources, say along the African coast, it would be the other countries all have this bunch of fish in that country sticks out. There would be a tremendous pressure on it to also uh, to also uh, let the boat in because then this stuff become more and more valuable. So because of that, each country acts, cannot be seen as acting on its own, becomes part of a system. So fisheries must be seen as a system. You, you see them as a global system once you have made your machines sufficiently big. The, the specific tools that you've developed are things like fish base and, yeah. and, uh, and ecopath. Um, can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah. This fish base is a, a database that uh, I imagine, say, say when, we, when you were working in the tropics, there was no Google, there was no internet and stuff. And people didn't have the data that they needed to make a decision about the fisheries. Uh, so even if the system had worked, the management system and so on, Information was not available. And the information system that existed at the time, they provided essentially abstracts or bibliographies. So you, you, you would go to the library and they would give you a bibliography of uh, fishing information in, in Indonesia or something. But if you were in Indonesia or an Indone and an Indonesian, you still wouldn't have the, the information because you, you, this information might be in, in an in London or in Paris or whatever. So the point was, can we make the, the information itself available rather than the meta information, the information about the information? And uh, the idea was to get a, a portrait of a, a fish, a commercial fish at first, uh, in terms of growth, in terms of, of, of its size, in terms of uh, its habits and so on. Uh, uh, a portrait 
um, computerized with the sources indicated so that you could use it directly. That would be extracted from the sources. And this ID was, I, I, I convinced a German colleague, Rainer Fröse at the time, and we, and we designed such a system and uh, that before CD-ROM existed and before, uh, and it was to be distributed in diskettes, oh, yeah. you know, these little diskettes. And we, we engaged two or three persons to were uh, encoding the, the data. And before we, <laughs> before we, 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 we knew we had uh, 15 people who are encoding. We had, uh, they have encoded now for 20 years and we have covered all fish in the world and a system that's 35,000 species about and the system is online. And this is the biggest scientific database in the world uh, available to anybody free of charge. And I cannot go anywhere in a university or NGO and they don't use it, where they don't use it. Everybody uses it. Everybody, it's a, one of the biggest success we had. But, but we cannot get funding for it because like Wikipedia, you know, this is something that, uh, like the air, that, like the air we breathe. So um, the European Union funded it at first, but now, oh, it's difficult. It's difficult. We, we get little project here and there, but we really live from the hand in mouth. Now, Echopath was another thing that basically it was invented by a colleague in, uh, in, uh, in Hawaii and as a tool to put together the information on an ecosystem, who eats what, and what happens when something that eats something else is moves up or down in abundance. And this was a neat, a neat solution to a big old problem. And uh, before the, the problem were much too complicated. They were running on mainframe and stuff, and it, it was impossible. You had to be a grand priest to, to kind of, uh, a computer priest to kind of uh, have uh, access to it. And this colleague developed that simple system, which could be run on a microcomputer at the time, like Apple II and stuff. Beautiful. But because of the cycle of funding they had in Hawaii, in NOAA, uh, you had to work on something else. And basically, I took it from him and I made it uh, available to more people and um, I, I contributed to it being widespread. And I hired a, a young Dane uh, to work on this, to reprogram it, to and uh, it's Willie Christensen, he's now not, he's still a Dane, but he's not that young, and he's a professor here, and, uh, and, uh, and he's still working on the dissemination refinement of this software. Um, my colleague Carl Walters came into the game, and what was before a, a more static snapshot kind of view of an ecosystem was given leg by him. In other words, it, 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 it can describe changing uh, things and now from the simple software that it was it has become a very sophisticated thing maybe maybe a, pre a new priesthood is emerging around it um, um, but uh, this is certainly something that was very successful as well and this is it's now become a modeling software isn't it right? yeah, yeah it is yeah. it is it is not a modeling software, it's the Leap. modeling <laughs> People are, are measuring uh, other software by, by that standard. This is like, uh, like Excel or Microsoft. Uh, you know, people are using it, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications uh, published. There is now, in a, in a few weeks, uh, in this room, a consortium will be founded. Um, of institution that support it, and like Fishbase uh, also has, uh, that will help uh, the founders, uh, you know, unlo uh, unload it onto the shoulders of uh, younger people. Um, that is, 
this is very successful. And in fact, uh, NOAA, uh, the US uh, agency, has considered Ecopath one of the 10 biggest things that it had done in its entire 200 years history. National Oceanographic uh, yeah. and Atmospheric Administration, right? Yeah. And this That's is one right. of the, the things that, one of the top 10 achievements within that yeah. 200 years they've been around. Uh, yeah. That's so fabulous. they, because it was started by their colleague, uh, by one of their staff, but uh, w the three of us, uh, Carl Walters, Willie Christensen and myself, were mentioned in this uh, thing because, uh, because it would have died in infancy uh, if we had not picked it up. Tell me about seearoundus.org, which is your or oh, that be here, right? Well, yeah. Uh, basically, it all started with I was uh, working in the Philippines, and I saw the problems being similar in different parts of the world, and they would have to be addressed on a global basis. But uh, the outfit I worked for uh, just underwent a crisis, and I accepted the job here. And I I was invited two years after I had started here three years after I started here, at uh, a meeting of the Pew Charitable Trust, who but essentially they, they had invited five, six people. What would you do if you had support money uh, to, and you would be asked to make, to tell us what's happening in the world ocean? And in characteristic, characteristic fashion, they said, we need more data. So uh, each of them said, we need more data. Uh, and uh, they were, there was an oceanographer, somebody working on plankton, somebody working, uh, different type of oceanographers. And I said, I, I let them do that because I, I saw that they were hooking themselves on some, of some line that we need more data. The, our virus discipline had been working for 100 years, and they need more data. And uh, then it was my turn. I summarized all they had said, and I said that the, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the Day, since it has collected this data on fisheries for 50 years, we should analyze these data because they are bound we, we are interacting with the sea, extracting catch from them. If the sea is changing, this is bound to be reflected in the a, in a composition and the magnitude of the catches. So because we are everywhere trying to get most out, out of the sea. And so I carried the day, the gentlemen were all asked to go, I was asked to stay, and I wrote a proposal. It was chronicling, the, something like chronicling the decline of uh, the sea or something like that, a uh, pessimistic title. And they had it reviewed, and all eight people who, who reviewed it said, it, it is not going to work, these people cannot do it, and uh, we should do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and the head staffer there, the, the Dr. Josh Reichert put his head on the block and said, I'm going to give them a support to start such a project as they say they can, but we'll do only the North Atlantic, right? So at a test bed. And this was a good thing because the North Atlantic has lots of other data with which the catch can be complemented. And we scrambled. We did, uh, we did uh, lots of work. And, and we had, after two years, we had a review, a really serious review of what have you achieved, and we had achieved so much that since we never had a review. We, we just did one year, did the other. And uh, the, what we did in the first years is, uh, is summarized in a book called uh, In the Perfect Ocean, about the North Atlantic that I did. And, and uh, since uh, we, we, every year we negotiate about uh, some achievable goal that we can do. And our goal now is to, is to produce uh, in the year 2013 to send to the press, 
to, to a publisher uh, a book that would document the real catch of the world. Because the, the f we, in the course of the work, we discovered that, that the real catch, the, of, uh, that the catch of countries is much more than they report to FAO. So that uh, scholars and decision makers at FAO that work with FAO data are completely misled. Um, uh, basically, we, we're catching far more, perhaps 30, 50 percent more, perhaps even more than, than FAO tells us, especially in developing countries, especially uh, uh, cat, the catch of small scale fisheries. So, the developing countries have a small scale fisheries sector that feeds the, the countryside that they are not aware of because they care only about export fisheries, the shrimp and so on. Oh um, yes, and if it doesn't come into a, a, a larger market, yeah. it doesn't get captured. Yeah, right? uh, and so the, the world catch, and hence is much bigger than, than is thought, the catch, this difference comes mainly from small scale fisheries. That means losing fisheries as, as they are now would mean a bigger effect on food security throughout the world than uh, is commonly assumed. Because fish contributes much more to the human diet than is assumed. Of course, that's the implication, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that is yeah. an implication. Yeah. And I expect this, the work toward this um, to be finished uh, next year. We, we, we now have like a, a lots of students and research assistants and, and partners outside the, who work on, on this what we call catch reconstruction to infer the catch, the real catch, from statistics plus. Because uh, in most countries it's even not the Department of Fisheries that send the data to FAO. This is the Department of Finance, the Department of Trade, and so they don't send everything that is available. So by recovering what is available and processing it to make it uh, compatible with the rest, we can uh, actually improve the quality of the data. Okay. Come on. Uh, what emerges from this conversation is a, it's a really frightening picture of an ocean that's so heavily exploited that it's you know, we're down to a very small portion, back to our baseline question, you're down yeah. to a very small portion of what was once there. You called for no catch zones and for an end to subsidies. Yeah. Can you talk about those two? Well, if I start with the subsidies, basically when a stock is depleted and, and you catch little per unit of effort, say per day fishing, basically the stock is telling you something which is give, leave me alone. Uh, and this signal doesn't have to be heard by fishers who gets subsidies from another sector, from the government. Basically, you can have a situation that the fishers is fishing for subsidies and whether there is a fish or not in the water plays no role. And that's certainly the case for uh, heavily subsidized fishers in France, for example, or in other countries, in Japan perhaps. Um, so you can, you can fish. The, the normal mechanism should be that uh, that uh, since uh, the stock is overfished, you, you don't you leave it alone, so it can be built. But subsidies suppress this uh, automatic repair, and uh, thus they are very negative. We, we, have, uh, we are the first to have really estimated subsidies at, uh, on a global basis, also for in developing countries by different categories. And our numbers have replaced now other numbers but that were produced by the OECD or the World Bank and they are used by the, uh, the World Trade Organization and, and other organizations in the, in the um, deliberation. Uh, it, has not, it has not been possible to reduce subsidies to, 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 but they are now included in the Doha round and in future rounds of the WTO. So and, and, but they're on a massive scale, right? Yeah, about about uh, 26 million billion, sorry, dollars per 
per year, of which about 20 are negative subsidies that, that contribute to enhancing the catching capacity of the boat. Um, um, so the subsidy work has been very rewarding because we have seen uh, it has been widely adopted by the agencies that we targeted in a way and uh, that has become the numbers that uh, that uh, the are use of policy that Yes, and that's quite stunning, isn't it? Because in, in the first place, you've gone out and done something that's really never been done before, and that's yeah. trying to get a handle on what's the yeah. state of the world's ocean, the state of catches, yeah. all of that. And now you really are addressing that in a global way, which yeah. normally we, we deal with fisheries yeah. on a country by country or even a province yeah, by province right. kind of basis. Uh, but this, isn't that is, uh, this is our niche. Um, fisheries can be studied and must be studied at local basis also because you need to manage the stocks and so on. So I'm not knocking anybody, but uh, the the global niche, if I, if I can say, was not uh, was not occupied. So that that has been is our shtick. Um, when I when I uh, the second part of your question was about, about marine protected areas, the, basically the expansion of fisheries that uh, I described before, in space, in depth, and into new species is an expansion that has abolished the, remain, the, the, the spaces that existed where the fish could be. And for example, the best example is uh, for Canada is uh, uh, cod. It could be exploited 500 years and more with uh, abandon because the gear that was used, the lines and the traps, go to about 50 to 100 meters. So you, you cannot catch any of the cod that are deeper, and you catch the cod only if they, if they show up at, in shallow water. With trawls, and I was as a student on a German trawler because I studied in Germany, with trawls, you could, you could go get them at, at 500,000 meters depth, and, and so they did. And so the, the depth refuge was invaded. So was the distance refuge. The ice refuge could be invaded by having ice-breaking trawler and so on. So the refuges which had made possible the sustainability of the stock because we, we, we scratch only the edge of it, these refuges were invaded. And marine protected areas or marine reserves that are not fished would be the equivalent of the re-establishing the equivalent of these refuges. But what do we have in terms of marine protect protection? It's less than 1%. And, and so we have almost no protection for the big fish in the sea. Small wonders that they go. Imagine we would like to have trees on land but you could go everywhere, including in Stanley Park, with, with a chainsaw. There would be not one tree alive. Yeah, you've also said the public is the ultimate owner of the fish, and ultimately it's the public that are going to have to call for this. But how is that to be done? How could, the, how could well, that be accomplished? Well, first of all, it's not, I hope it's not contentious. The, the public is the owner of the fish, as it is the owner of everything else that is not private the crown on the ship implies that in Canada, for example. So the government is, is only the manager of the resource for the time it is in charge. It, it, is, not, uh, uh, it, it is not there to give away the, the resource, to sell it or something. It is the manager of the resource on behalf of the public at large. And up to now, there was a tacit uh, misunderstanding that uh, the owner of the resource is the fishers. Well, in effect, they could do it, but if they trash a place, it's time to remember that they are not the owners. You know, if, if you have neighbors or friends that occupy a house that, that you have no use for, a wing of a house, you let them, but it, when they trash a place, you kind of reminded, this is, this is actually my house. And uh, 
Now it's time for the real owner of the resource to ask themselves, well, these fishes, do they, are they doing to the resource what is needed for the resource to be handed over to the next generation? Are they making best use of the resource? Are multiple use co compatible and stuff with what they do? And, and this is, in many place, cases, not the case. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about aquaculture because I think I remember you having said that the science about aquaculture is pretty solid and, and pretty clear. And, and I'd uh, like to get you to talk about it. We, we had a conversation just recently with Alana Mitchell, and she was describing the process of, of the expansion of fisheries as being from big freshwater fish to big nearshore fish to bigger and then smaller offshore right. fish and fish deeper. And then the last stage is aquaculture. You wind up farming the fish. But this yeah. is not a... The aquaculture is highly... You have to not talk about aquaculture as if it were one thing. Uh, I, I hate that because, in general, people confuse issues, but one has to differentiate. Uh, usually this says nothing, but one has to. And one has to divide it up a little bit. The first division is aquaculture is essentially a thing that happens in China. It's weird, but it is so. Two-thirds of the catch, more than two-thirds of the production of the world and of aquaculture is in China. They do that massive aquaculture in freshwater and in, 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 uh, in seawater at immense cost to the environment. That is cost that, in part, we don't want to pay. That two-thirds China. One-third is the rest of the world. Now, in that third, we have lots of barbells, mussels, oysters, and so on. But we also have lots of, lots of um, mar marine fish or predators. And these predators have to be fed with other fish. Now, with fish meal from other fish. And there is no getting around that. The, the aquaculture industry says they reduce the ratio and stuff, but given that they forever increase, the amount, the absolute amount they use is increasing. And further, um, about one third of the fish that are reported, reported caught, about 25 million, 30 million tons of fish, is turned to fish meal. It's reduced to fish meal and fish oil. Of that amount, half is used for um, chicken and, and pigs and stuff, and half for salmon and other fish. So one-sixth of all fish caught is used to grow other fish. And, and this other fish are carnivores fish. And you cannot, again, get away from that. If you feed them with other things than fish, they will taste like tofu, they will get sick, and, and it doesn't work. So basically, aquaculture needs fish to produce fish, they are this form of aquaculture. So you cannot, in the long run, um, produce fish that way, because uh, you need uh, more fish to feed the aquaculture. And uh, the production of carnivores, the more you produce, the less fish you have. This is something that will not get into the head of most people, because they see a salmon, but they don't see the sardine that go into feeding it. And in Canada, at least, they don't eat. They wouldn't eat the sardine. But everywhere else in the world, they would. So uh, this is uh, more than a zero-sum game. This is, uh, we lose when we do aquaculture. Um, we, humanity, um, when you do aquaculture of carnivores. When we do aquaculture of low trophic level animals, such as, um, such as uh, oysters and mussels and stuff, 
I was in Brussels a few days, a few weeks ago, and I ate mussels and f and French fries. You know, this is this is marvelous. This is this is for the gods. Uh, that that form of aquaculture can feed millions and millions and millions at a certain environmental cost that China is willing to pay. We we want carnivores, we don't want to pay the environmental cost. That's for ex why we have so much arguing in BC about salmon. And, and, uh, and altogether, we cannot uh, solve the, uh, the food problem, the seafood problem, scarcity problem, with aquaculture, with this form of aquaculture, any more than we can, trans we, we can solve the, 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 the problem of uh, downtown gridlock with giving everybody a Maserati, you know, this, yeah. What about the interaction between farm salmon and wild salmon? Is well, I'm not an expert, but the way it looks, this is, uh, this is bad news. Um, there is an epic battle going on on this coast, but if you go from first principle, you accumulate a pile of protoplasm of meat, of live meat somewhere, you're going to have a big, big parasite problem. And if you have similar meat, similar animals going around that are wild, they're going to be infected. That's from first principle. And nothing, but nothing that I've read has convinced me that the opposite is true. That that everybody that uh, raised in, in intensive, uh, in intensive uh, uh, plants, meat, or anything actually, could even be, be grains, will attract, will attract bugs and pests and or various kinds. And it would be a miracle if it were not the case for, for, uh, for, if it were not the case for salmon here. And since I'm here, I have heard a, a constant series of lies. Uh, you know, the, the salmon will never escape. Then if they escape, they will not establish themselves. And, and no, we don't kill, uh, we, we don't kill sea lions. And no, we don't do. It's all, it's all, it's been collection of lies. The same lies that the same companies are telling people in Chile. You know, the, the in Chile, the, the even less regulation than here, so they, they pack the, the, the salmon in enormous quantities, in enormous farms, and they were told, don't do that, you get bad news, they, with enormous quantity of antibiotics, and antibiotics, as you well know, don't work with viruses, and uh, all of a sudden they had a giant virus outbreak, and the farm went all, were full of sick salmon, and and they essentially half of the industry went bust. And now they're listening. So, so basically, this story that happened in DC is essentially boring because there is a huge amount of bad faith, self-serving bad faith on the part of the industry. In Norway, where the evolution is way ahead I don't. I won't say they are better control, but 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 they admit to problems because that they had to do because the evolution uh, of the problem, the emergence of problem, happened 15, 20 years ago, and 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 they had to deal with this. Here, they they still think that they can do it with PR and silencing people and. The usual tricks. It's it's actually very sad. I um, uh, I, I think finally I, I, I wanted to uh, when I read about what you've been doing and when I as to the extent that I understand it, I think I see part of a big big trend away from reductionism, a, sen a sense that the truth that we used to figure we found out by slicing things very very narrowly and testing them very very tightly is a truth, but there's a, there's a big truth that's the truth of the overarching picture yeah. in which that occurs. I s seem to see that in the general intellectual atmosphere or climate of the day, and I sure think I see it yeah. in your work. But uh, 
I had once written an essay about reductionism and holism, uh, but holism is often embraced by people who want to be like fuzzy, who want whose whose logic is not clear, whose argument are not clear, and I think I, I think that you can't you can't abandon the the things you learn when you do your reductionist science because. Reductionism science works. It, it works, and it has given us vaccine, and it has given us all kind of insight, and that make our life better. I, I the metaphor that I would use is, uh, is therefore not holism as alternative, but really what I what I suggested before. You build a bigger machine. Uh, you build a bigger machine because then, with that bigger machine, you can you can see more, and. Uh, when you see more, you generalize at a higher kind of plane. But the process is not inherently different. It's not, it's not sharp thinking against woolly thinking. Uh, and it's, it's sharp thinking at a bigger scale. Uh, I, I think that's what it is. Two more questions, and the first one you don't have to answer, but it strikes me, I'm, I'm always interested. I'm a, a Scottish-Canadian, and I did my PhD thesis on Sir Walter Scott. Um, oh. so, and I've always been interested in the relationship between what a person studies and what the person's experience has been. And it strikes me that your whole life makes you a kind of an international person. I mean, you've got yeah. profound roots in, what, four or five countries? Yes. You speak several yes. languages and so forth. I'm wondering if, uh, if you'd care to comment on the, the fact that that makes you sensitive to some of these things that might not be yeah. so striking well, to someone of a less... I have, I have gone public with some of the, my problems and some of my background, so I, I can respond to this. Uh, basically, I grew up as a person of color in a in a European setting, and uh, I was I did not suffer from it because people were not nasty to me, but but they made me aware of of being different. I was not different, but they thought I was, and I became so by in reaction to that, and I had this notion that I could not continue to live in Europe. And uh, it so happened that I left at the time that young people really had problems getting jobs. <laughs> so, so it might have been good for me. And because I could, because I'm biracial or whatever, I, I could emphasize more with people with the brown people that uh, are the majority of the world. We are the majority of the world. And uh, I could emphasize more, and they could see me more also. And so I, I had a shortcut into other, other people, which uh, European that, that are more beige, uh, would not have and would, would have more work to do to get into. So I, I got into people's head and I got into people's head in Africa and Asia and stuff. And I really, really saw that people are really, really similar in different countries. Uh, it, it is not a thing that I, I said because it was uh, fashionable, but it was I really so the similarity between different countries. But why are they different then? But why the difference, the material difference? And, and, and then you, you, you start looking at mechanisms that are strong, that make people do certain things, and basically concentrating on this mechanism rather than difference on the inherent difference between people uh, made me what I am. And it so happens that in the 90s, it, we began to understand where people came from, where Homo sapiens came from, the, that we are all part of the diaspora. Well, not all. Those of us who are still in Africa are not. But uh, that uh, all humans originate from Africa, uh, left Africa's 
the non-African 70,000 years ago. This is well understood. And uh, basically, there has been no time to elaborate different way of organizing the brain. So because people are so similar philo physiologically and, uh, uh, and uh, in the in the thinking process, the stuff that we the difference that we s see must be a bit phenomena, and so I and and that uh, is now confirmed with with evolutionary psychology with uh, Darwinian psychology that coming to the fore and replacing this uh, dreadful postmodernist nonsense that uh, has been haunting in, in universities, and so I I think that. Uh, me being bi biracial was actually a huge advantage that I cut through lots of the nonsense that uh, uh, other people had to work and the West needed 20, 30 years to, to cut through. Yeah. I think we're all very fortunate that you had that background, because <laughs> it's led to some yeah. you know, really fabulous work. Yeah. Yeah. The one final thing I want to ask you about was this room. Because you were saying that there will be a conference here, and, and that what, I, what we learned as we came in was this is a very special room constructed yeah, for right, very special is. purposes. It, it is. And uh, we had the idea uh, as this uh, building got uh, planned, uh, both Willy Christensen of the Ecopath uh, stuff and I, uh, that uh, we, should, uh, we should have a, a series of conferences. Uh, our funders at Pew was uh, of the opinion also that. We should have a series of conference, a high-level conference, where we would where we'd play people scenarios of what happens when what they think is right is done, and then alternative scenarios. In order to play scenarios without being, without being disturbed by outside event, the room must be closed, and the scenarios are presented here. And we got the enthusiastic support of the then um, Dean of um, Graduate Studies and uh, various other people that they put aside some of the money for building the building to equip this room. And each, each uh, position has a computer. And uh, there is a, a master computer that organized them. And you can show uh, this scenario. Now, the software that uh, was supposed to do all of this is lagging behind. We have it now. We have it now. And uh, the conference, uh, high level, we had highest level, uh, have not taken place. But we have mid-level conference that have taken place. And the room has, uh, everybody that, uh, that has been in the room has appreciated the fact that because you don't see the outside, you're forced to deal with each other. And this, this uh, table, you might see that it, had, it has a weird shape. It's not an oval. It's not round. It's not square. It, it is uh, really found, uh, this guy, uh, a Danish philosopher and architect, uh, has developed uh, this uh, shape. This is also the shape of the Olympia, uh, Olympia Stadium in, um, in Mexico City. Uh, it, is, it is intermediate between a circle and uh, a rectangle, and you, 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 you have no place where you dominate, you know. And uh, so this is supposed to encourage, uh, to encourage dialogue. And we have found, every time we have a, a little meeting, that uh, it is propitious, it is favorable to dialogue. And we have here uh, fishing down the food web as a, a sculpture. This is the only scientific concept that has become a sculpture. Daniel Pauly, one of the few scientists to examine the impact of the global fishery on the global ocean and to reveal the grave dangers facing the fisheries that sustain us all. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.